Yes, let's get started. All righty, so first off, uh, well, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good uh, evening, everyone, depending on uh, where you're connecting uh, today. Uh, my name is Alessio, I'm the founder and CEO of Forever Fooding, and I'm thrilled to uh, welcome our uh, speakers today uh, to talk about uh, vertical farming. But before we do that and open uh, basically the panel uh, later on with actually some uh, heavy waiters of uh, vertical farming, uh, I'm going to give you a really brief introduction about uh, Forward Fooding and the FoodTech 500. Uh, we're all here to basically celebrate uh, the world, uh, world's entrepreneurial food tech talent. And uh, I can't be more excited to... Um, to basically share with you the agenda. To begin with, uh, we're going to give you a brief introduction about uh, the FoodTech 500 and uh, this year's edition, uh, which is actually our second edition. Uh, but then, you know, to really give the stage uh, to our, our protagonist of tonight's this webinar, um, we're going to have uh, Belinda Clark from Director of AgriTechy moderating the panel. And uh, we will have Mark Oshima from AeroFarms, David Lee from UpArvest, Mark Lozel from AgriLution, and Gregory Loon from Natufi Labs. We're going to finish up with uh, a Q&A and uh, some final remarks uh, where you guys uh, or the people who are participating uh, will be able to actually ask questions. And uh, we'll kindly ask you to do that through the chat so that we can um, actually uh, then pass them over to Belinda, uh, who will be opening the Q&A. Um, but just a brief introduction about Forward Fooding. Uh, we are the world first collaborative platform for the food and beverage industry and that foster food innovation via food tech data intelligence and corporate startup collaboration. Uh, we've set up the business back in 2015 with a very simple uh, mission, which was to foster food innovation to actually redesign our food system. And uh, um, we work basically with all the ecosystem uh, stakeholders, uh, including corporates, uh, startups, investors, accelerators, uh, and even consulting uh, and market research firms um, to really empower them with data and insights to understand what is happening in the agri-food tech ecosystem. Um, our services includes uh, data and insights through our Food and Data Navigator, which is the world's first uh, data intelligence platform uh, for the agri-food tech ecosystem. Uh, scouting and matchmaking, where we basically make collaborations happen by connecting uh, corporates and uh, investors and accelerators to selected entrepreneurs from our global uh, network. And last but not least, through our food innovation hubs, which are now in London and Barcelona, um, and through actually, of course, the Food Tech 500, we give visibilities to uh, the companies of our network, um, and we even incubate some within our physical locations in Europe. Uh, but really quickly about the Fidita Navigator, uh, this is a platform that we built back in 2019, which now counts about 11,000 ecosystem actors, including startups and scale-up companies, uh, incubators, accelerators, and ecosystem enablers, um, investors, primarily uh, institutional uh, and VC firms, uh, and corporate organizations and corporate venture capital. And the idea we, behind it was that we were basically struggling ourselves to understand all and keeping up to speed with all the latest developments that were coming out of the ecosystem. So we built this platform to really understand the connections behind each single players of the ecosystem and, and really monitor, you know, all the, the latest developments, who's investing in who, uh, how many patents, you know, companies are filing, in which, uh, in which verticals, and uh, uh, basically, you know, monitoring the evolution of, uh, of the industry. Um, our network really at glance, really quickly, we work with about 20 corporate clients, and we have completed about 35 strategic consulting uh, uh, projects. We have five Fortune 500 companies in our portfolio, and about 5,600 international food tech uh, startups and scale-ups within our proprietary databases. Um, we have incubated about 15 companies, which are now residents uh, in our innovation hubs in London and, uh, and Barcelona. And with the FoodTech 500, we have received about uh, 3, uh, over 3,200 applications over the last two editions, as this year's editions was really our second one. Um, these are some of, our, some of our partner supporters and clients. Uh, as you can see, we put them all in one uh, uh, bucket as we basically believe that um, they are collaborating you know, among each other and they should be you know, uh, bundled up into, into one place. So we don't 
like to treat, if you will, our clients as uh, necessarily clients, but really as partners. And, um, and this actually led us uh, last year to create uh, food tech, the Food Tech 500, which uh, um, had a very simple mission from the very beginning, which was to basically shine a spotlight on the leading innovators across the agri-food tech ecosystem who are creating impactful solutions to better our food system. And uh, this actually occurred over a lunch uh, uh, meeting with our team where we were wondering, you know, who was the next company who was going to do IPO. And uh, um, given that we all had, you know, different point of views, we decided to um, basically crowdsource, you know, uh, applications from uh, the network to then identify, you know, the ones who we think will, will become, you know, the, food, the Fortune 500 of, uh, of this ecosystem. Um, and to do that, we basically created a scoring mechanism that uh, uh, includes three, three main criteria. On the one end, the business size score, the digital food score, which is actually taken from an algorithm that we built off the back of the Food Data Navigator, uh, along with actually our tech partners. And uh, then um, we have created a sustainability score, which was uh, done from scratch in absence of a of a leading, let's say, framework uh, that was looking specifically at sustainability. And we created it um, with completely based on the SDGs. So this was based on a self-assessed survey that we asked the companies to fill out. Um, but again, we wouldn't have done it uh, uh, without the support of our uh, technical partners, sponsors, and media partners. So. Uh, we love and we embrace, you know, collaboration as uh, really the essence of, of our work. And uh, I would like to, to thank them to basically uh, having supported us. Data Scouts, which is our uh, tech partner that have helped us to build uh, the Food Data Navigator. Uh, the University of Turin, who was the um, collaboratory that created the sustainability score. Um, all our media partners, which have helped us to basically um, spread the word about the Food Tech 500, not only you know, when we had created the application process, but also uh, with, when we started uh, uh, distributing the list across every corner of the world. And of course, our sponsors, Neom and Rottenstead, uh, who have helped us to actually uh, make uh, the Food Tech 500 2020 uh, a reality. Um, just some key numbers this year, we have actually uh, raised the bar a lot higher as uh, we actually received more than 2,000 applications from about 63 countries. Um, and so far we had received about 370,000 uh, page views from 60,000 uh, different visitors from 170 countries, which made us, makes us really proud about uh, the visibility that we can actually provide to the companies that make it into our list. And for actually next year, we have already received the 450 plus applications, which uh, it's, uh, it's a good signal that uh, this list will grow uh, further and uh, hopefully we'll be able to even uh, feature, you know, more companies than, than, than this year. Um, just some key highlights of, um, and stats about the, the listing this year. Um, we had uh, represented about 52 countries as a, as a cluster of uh, 500 companies. They've raised more than 4.1 4 billion uh, euros. Um, and uh, out of 500, about 374 are revenue generating and 423 uh, have received already funding. But what I really love uh, highlighting is the fact that um, this year we have actually gone above and beyond to provide as much visibility as we could to our companies, but also to better understand um, the composition of their funding teams and the leadership teams. And um, we basically found out that 25%, more than 25% uh, of the companies are actually female founded. Uh, about 16% are BAM founded. 3% uh, are LGBT plus founded and 1.2% are founded by people with disability. Um, this, in my view, showcases how diverse and inclusive this uh, ecosystem is. And of course, you know, if it's only 500 companies out of a, a few thousands, uh, but uh, if that is, you know, representative of the whole ecosystem, I think uh, it can only keep growing and becoming even more thriving because compared to any other tech, it's a lot more diverse and inclusive. 
Um, and as I mentioned earlier, to basically give visibility uh, to the companies and as much as we could. Uh, this year, we have created actually 18 uh, new uh, reports that showcased uh, different verticals of uh, of the of the 500 listing, and uh, uh, here are some that we have uh, released over the last uh, month or so. Um, and today we are really excited about uh, sharing the one about all things ag tech. So we are uh, releasing top five vertical farming, top five ag biotech, and top five precision farming. Uh, which are now available on our website at forwardfooding.com uh, slash reports. But without further ado, and uh, I'm going to pass it over to Belinda, who is our moderator for the uh, panel, uh, so that she can uh, get things Let's started. Focus. Thank you so much, Alessio, and a very warm welcome and hello to everybody on the call. I think this is probably one of the most globally diverse events that I've ever moderated and you're very welcome, it's, it's great to see you. So I run Agritech E, we're our UK based global membership organisation. We think we're Europe's largest private sector organisation of its type and what we do is really bring together this Agritech innovation ecosystem, helping the science and the innovation and the R&D to make its way into the end users and the businesses that are really going to uh, sweat that asset and add value through use of the innovation. And we're very proud that Forward Fooding is a member of Agritech E, and we're also very proud that so many of our members are featuring in the Food Tech 500 lineup. So it's a great pleasure to have been invited uh, to moderate this discussion and to really work with an esteemed panel, and everybody says esteemed panel, but I think what we have uh, this afternoon, this evening, this morning, depending on your, your time scale, is not only the thought leaders, but also the doers. So we're going to be hearing from some people who have really actually done the things that a lot of people are still talking about. And they feature in the Food Tech 500, they're the, the, some of the top companies in that list. Uh, so it's a great pleasure for us to be able to hear about their journey and learn from their experiences. So just a reminder, if you'd like to ask some questions, please, if you could put them in the chat. Uh, because there are so many people on the, at the meeting today, we're going to be triaging your questions via the chat. So please don't hold back. Please do so. We're going to hear from each of our speakers in turn. and We'll have a little bit of a chat with them. We'll move into the panel discussion and take some of your questions. OK, so without further ado, I'd like to start off talking uh, to Mark, if we may. Mark Oshima uh, from Aerofarms. Mark, if you'd like to join me. Yeah, great to uh, connect here, Melinda. And um, Hi, before even starting, just a congratulations to Alessio and uh, the excitement in seeing the latest numbers of how uh, your work has grown, the impact. I uh, just want to be able to congratulate you on that as well. So, Mark, would you like to just introduce Aerofarms and uh, any of the, the latest hot off the press news you might want to share with us? Just in, introduce people to Aerofarms if they haven't come across the business before, if you would. Sure. We, uh, we've been uh, one of the leading indoor vertical farming companies. Uh, we've been doing this since 2004. So uh, we'll be the first to tell you that there's a lot of complexity. Uh, we've taken a very different approach in terms of uh, everything you see with our indoor vertical farms. And you can see an image of one of the farms behind me. Uh, this is proprietary technology that we've developed. And we started with a very different proposition of thinking about what does the plant need and then creating the right environment. And so uh, when we think about our team of over 170 people, it's around this expertise and we think about the mechanical design, the environmental, we think about the biological, uh, we think about world-class operators, food safety, uh, but we're also thinking about uh, the genetics and then we're thinking about the digitization and thinking about this as a fully connected farm. How does this all go together? And this is allowing us to be able to think about not only the work we're doing with our commercial production on leafy greens, uh, but how do we leverage this expertise as really a platform, a growing technology platform that can help address a broader range of agriculture needs. So anything plant-based and so, uh, as a company, uh, we are at an exciting stage. We did announce uh, this past Friday going public is one of the ways that we can really be able to capitalize on the opportunities that are ahead of us. Uh, that will go to farm expansion and, and focus on leafy greens. It'll also go to uh, continued work that we're doing on the R&D uh, and the business development. Uh, we have a whole arm that's working with Fortune 500 companies, helping them with their agricultural supply chain needs. 
And we have a whole collaboration of both public and private partnerships thinking about, again, how do we move the entire industry forward? Uh, one of the things that we're doing is in a wide range of categories, we just announced yesterday a major partnership with Hortifruit, which is the number one berry company uh, in the world. And it's about our experience in, we've had years of experience of growing berries. And so we're gonna be applying this expertise down into the world of blueberries and cane berries. So a lot going on for the company, a uh, lot has gone into really getting us to this foundation. Uh, and we're excited to be able to be able to share our story, but also uh, get inspiration from others that we're gonna hear more from today as well. It's, it's a great story, Mark, and that kind of vertical integration uh, across the business uh, gives you a, a lot of flexibility uh, in terms of your business model going forward. Can you, what, what can you share with us about the technology itself? Are you mainly hydroponic or aeroponic? Uh, what, yeah, so, so the aero and aero farms is a reference to aeroponics. Mm -hmm. And so we've seen a lot of tremendous uh, efficiencies in this way of growing with that and 95% less water than uh, the field and even 40% less than some of the different hydroponics approaches out there. And so we think about fresh water, 70% of agriculture is taking fresh water, 70% of pollution is coming from agriculture. So how do we think very differently about that incredible, important resource? Uh, it's one of the reasons why we're building a farm, for example, as we speak in the UAE, to be able to address you know, very tough growing environment and, and conditions in those kind of regions. Um, but the idea that we're doing is uh, we're actually technology agnostic. And so it depends on the plant or the crop. And so we actually use hydroponics as well. We use hybrid approaches, thinking about, again, what does the plant actually need and how do we create the perfect environment or system around that? And so uh, it's part of our, our legacy is the aeroponics, but the idea is that we embrace all technology. Okay, and, and across all crops as well. So there's a real challenge in there between understanding the biology of, of a baby leaf compared with a, a blueberry, I guess. Correct, and that's, uh, but it's you know, the same approach in terms of you know, understanding the biology, our plant scientists, and, and thinking about what are the essential elements that does the plant need to grow? And then we're thinking more importantly, what is it that we're trying to help solve? You know, so we, while we've grown hundreds of different varieties and multiple different crops, it's where we can add the right value. And so uh, sometimes it could be on the seeds and genetics. Sometimes it could be on the, the initial uh, germination and the offspring uh, before you do transplanting. Sometimes it's on the plant itself. Uh, but what's exciting is that it's not only the world of food, but it's also even the world of, when you're talking about verticals, um, it could be pharmaceutical, cosmeceutical, nutraceutical, to be able to apply this expertise to in as well. Absolutely, and I'm sure we'll come on to those different other market opportunities uh, a little bit a little bit later because it's absolutely certainly not just about uh, baby leaf and and herbs, is it? So, Mark, thank you, thank you so much. Can I now uh, turn to David, uh, David Lee from App Harvest? David, would you like to introduce uh, yourself and and App Harvest uh, for those who haven't met it before? Absolutely. And um, thanks for having us. It's exciting to be part of a, a growing community, but one that's already quite large, that's trying to make a difference in the world. Um, App Harvest is uh, based in central Appalachia and our approach uh, is a little different. Um, we like to use uh, what nature provides and enhance it. So locating our first uh, 2.8 million square foot farm in uh, Kentucky where the climate gets wetter, for example, allows us to recycle 90% of the water needs for our crop. Um, so, so we like to use the best of technology, but we wanna start with the fact that mother nature has given us um, a wonderful opportunity uh, at the very beginning. Um, our focus is on scale. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, our first farm and we're building 12 by 2025 is 60 acres or um, 50 if you're from the US. Uh, 50 U.S. football fields, you know, our reservoir that recycles rainwater is um, 70 Olympic uh, swimming pools. Um, and the reason why scale is important is not just because just of the because need, uh, but it's frankly important to create affordability. Um, the reality of food is we got to feed everybody and at the same time not uh, deplete the resources of the planet. Um, and then the last bit is, you know, we, we really are focused on trying to be a better food company, not just in the products we make, not just because it you know, has no chemical pesticides or recycles water, but we're trying to be a better food company uh, altogether. And that means you know, our, our B certification and our Benefit Corp status as a public company means that we like to provide more than a living wage to our employees. We like to operate in a way uh, that we hope investors and consumers reward. 
um, which is quite ambitious. It's, it's yet to be seen. Um, but we're super excited to participate and, and get to know others like Mark and many other allies. The problem we face, to be clear, is a multi-trillion dollar problem that is urgent. So it's a, it's a rising tide and the more diversity and approach, whether it's what Mark's doing or what we're doing, uh, is to all of our benefit. Um, so I'm excited to participate today. Nice, nice to meet you, David. And you've, you've got some quite interesting experience in terms of a, a kind of reverse merger through, through a SPAC, haven't you? So you've, you've got the t-shirt and, and I guess maybe a few battle scars on your back. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, um, I came from a company called Impossible Foods where I launched the business as the COO and CFO. It's, it's a private company. But my former days will, were all largely in very big public companies, including at Del Monte, where I ran the food business. So, so for, for those of us at the company who, um, as we say in the U.S., been around the block, uh, we, um, being public is not a new thing. But I think for the broader community on this, on this webcast, the idea of um, funding, you know, we raised nearly $500 million in going public through a SPAC, as, as Mark is going through as well. It, it presents something new for many of these younger companies. Um, for many of us at the, on the board uh, and on management, um, it, it's just one important way to achieve the mission. Um, so far, so good. I, I have been on the board since August, and I think my first day as president was the first day of trading under our own ticker, APPH. Um, and we're excited to prove uh, that being a public company can be absolutely in concert with being a company that makes a difference for the world. Grand. And just for those of you who haven't come across the term before, SPAC is Special Purpose Acquisition Company, is that right? Do you want to just, just in, in a couple of sentences, just explain to those who haven't encountered that model before, just to explain what that entails? Sure. Well, and again, not that I am the expert, but I am one participant of the process. Um, if you think about going public, there are largely always been three ways. You can do what's called an initial public offering, an IPO. Um, you can do what's now more fashionable lately, what's called a direct listing. And typically you don't get proceeds for the company when you would direct, do a direct listing, though that is potentially changing. And then there is this bull market we're in for what's called SPACs. A SPAC is when a company previously goes public, the actual SPAC goes public. In our case, it was Novus Capital Corporation. They go public and say to the public investor world, we have an idea that we could buy a private company and make it public and do well. Uh, and that promise that they make to their public investors uh, usually occurs where they have a two-year time frame to find what we call the target of a SPAC. Uh, and in our case, Novus Capital uh, found App Harvest and vice versa. We um, announced, uh, and it can go quickly, we announced in the late summer, early fall, uh, the fact that we had found our partner. Um, and uh, by January, January 25th, I believe, my first day, we were trading under our own ticker on NASDAQ. Um, along the way, most SPAC companies, if they um, are thinking about the long-term, raise what's called a pipe. Um, it is a, it's a collection of usually public company investors that are willing to seed a company. In our case, we raised you know, well over 300 million from the pipe from the likes of Fidelity and others. And so as a result, a company like ours um, and a company like Mark's can quickly become public uh, raise significant capital, um, and successfully on the other side of it, operate as a public company. But make no mistake, if you are going public through an IPO or a direct listing or a SPAC, on the other side of consummation, you have the same level of rigor, the same requirements, the same urgency uh, to operate as a, as a public company, which I view to be probably the highest level of rigor for a company as it, it performs its duties mm. for its investors. Um, so anyway, so that's, that's a little bit on, on what is a SPAC. That's very helpful and, and not for the faint hearted either, nor is an IPO, but uh, you're the other side of it now and uh, we look forward to hearing, hearing a little bit more about it over the next hour. Thank you for, for the moment. Can I now turn to Max? Max Lersel, you are the co-founder, aren't you, of, of Agrilution? Um, and this is quite a different take on the whole vertical farming space. You're, is, it, is it fair to call it a home appliance? I would say it's vertical as long as you have more than one layer. Right. Uh, so yeah, my name is Max Lessel. I'm co-founder and CEO of a company called Agrilution. 
and we are active in the what we call small scale or personal vertical farming space. So we've developed the first um, yeah, home appliance really to grow food. And the, the idea behind that was always to bring the point of consumption as uh, the point of production as close as possible to the point of consumption and thereby making use of all the benefits that uh, vertical farming or indoor farming technology has to offer. And back when I got involved with the space, which was roughly 10 years ago, um, there really wasn't anything, um, I mean, Mark and Aerofarms was around. And um, basically I started out mapping all the initiatives that were going on ag across the globe, um, no matter what scale and no matter what purpose. And uh, what we then started doing is we started connecting initiatives um, from research, from industry, uh, to provide them a platform to inter interact and create synergies. And through that, we, or I started understanding who was doing what back then. And back then this was like a very, very small space and everyone basically knew each other. So I've known Mark for years. And um, yeah, I started understanding that no one was really um, trying to offer small scale solutions to bring this tech into people's homes and to make use of all of the, the available benefits. And that's what really laid the foundation then for AgriLution. And um, I co-founded the company with a good friend of mine uh, roughly eight years ago. And the first years we then started developing this um, small scale vertical farming tech and, and released the first product, which we call a plant cube. Um, and that was back in 2019, beginning of 2019. And end of 2019, we then became a part of Miele, which is one of the leading premium appliance companies in the world. And so, yeah, since end of 2019, we've been working together with them. Um, and we're a private company. We're 100% daughter company of Miele now. Um, and we're currently active mainly in Europe. So we're active in Switzerland, Germany, Austria, the Benelux, um, but also eyeing other markets outside of, of Europe at the moment. And, and what can you grow in the plant cube? Is it, is it baby leaf and beyond? Uh, at the moment, uh, we have about 40 different varieties, which we've split into uh, three different categories. Uh, one is called uh, essentials, where we offer lots of different herbs, uh, as well as leafy greens. Um, then we have a category that we call chef's line. Uh, and under chef's line, we have lots of unique varieties that uh, people cannot get access to through normal retail channels. So these are, uh, for example, unique um, herbs or unique microgreens. And then we have dailies, which are dishes basically. So mixtures of salads or a smoothie mix or something to make a pesto. Mm -hmm. um, and we're launching something new next week, which I'm really excited about because no one has been offering that in our space yet, neither in, in the industrial scale uh, vertical farming nor in, in our consumer space. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a big variety of, of fresh produce. And why we're doing it as, at home is basically to um, also solve that last mile problem that you can at least grow a part of your daily needs right where you then actually also consume it uh, at home. Yeah, and that last mile or the, or the last five, 10 miles, they're sometimes the hardest and most expensive ones, aren't they? If you're at a just-in-time point with fresh produce, that's a, a tough space to be in. Okay. It also has a huge impact on the quality of the produce. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And will it be just for food always? Do you see, move, we'll talk a little bit about pharma a bit later on, pharma with a pH. <laughs> well, we, we're working on, on berries. Uh, we're working on non-food applications as well, but there is no clear um, public timeline of when we'll announce that. Okay. Excellent. Thank you so much. And I'd like to hear a little bit more about your journey uh, with Mealy a bit later on. We'll come back to that when we're talking sure. about kind of business models and, and scaling. And then finally, Gregory from Natufia Labs. Now, uh, that background belies where you actually are, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. So the, the background is, uh, is right now in, uh, you know, in Saudi Arabia. That's where we, we're calling you from. Um, but just to give you an idea of uh, what Natufia is, uh, Natufia, so you will take, you know, the, 
the big farm of you know David of Mar or Mark, and you know you put it you know in a small fridge size uh, appliance, and uh, and then in this appliance you can grow you know any kind of plants. Uh, we do you know lettuce, grains, you know cilantro, but you know also cherry tomatoes, uh, small veggies, um, you know chamomilla, and other things like that. You know. And the principle there, we went to a way that, you know, people really like to garden, but they like to garden without, you know, all the problem that, does, you know, just to get dirty. You know, the idea is always nice, but when you need to get your dirty and to really work on it every day, it's, uh, it's a different story. So I think Natufia solved this problem by uh, the fact that we're doing hydroponics. Okay, so it's, it's much more clean, but also our machine is, uh, is fully automatized. Okay, it's mean literally you, you plug it as a dishwasher and it's worked by itself, it's water, it's put the light and everything like that. It can literally go away, I don't know, three months and you know, the, the Natufia will still be, be running. It will be a, a jungle inside, but, but you will have you know, full, full of plant. So that, that's the product we have. Uh, we decided to really focus on the design as well. Uh, we felt that is it inside the home, um, you know, people need to to be as well connected with nature. That was an important factor. Uh, it's just not somewhere in a corner. Uh, we want them to interact with it. So we really focus on the design and the ability to really integrate it in uh, in your kitchen as a private person. But we also have you know chefs that are that are using our, our product. Excellent, thank you. And and I, I want to kind of. Use, use your um, experience, Gregory, to then move on to a conversation about location and sense of place. But if you can maybe give us some, some ideas. So you relocated the business, didn't you, to, to the Middle East? And that was to find a, a key strategic sort of investment partner, is that right? Yeah, I think that was a double, uh, you know, this is, those are double things. I think uh, we, we spent a lot of time in Dubai. You know, we did a, a textile program, you know, a couple of years back uh, and we were in Dubai and we understand, you know, the region offer a lot of possibilities. Uh, it's countries that are growing, you know, very fast and they definitely in need of uh, vertical farming, you know, system like yours, you know, big system because, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's a lot of sands is not no water. Saudi Arabia, if you take an example, is five times bigger than France and they don't have any rivers. <laughs> so that's, that's just to give you the, the area. And, um, and they definitely need you know, this, this farming. So we moved there for this reason, because we feel it's a, it's a great market there. Mm -hmm. And our investors, uh, Kaust, uh, what is the, um, the King Abdullah um, University of Science and Technology, what would be an equivalent if you take to the US of uh, you know, MIT, uh, decided to, to invest in our company because uh, we do a, a lot of R&D as well. You know, we really focus on the plants and on the automatization, you know, to give the maximum amount of, of vitamins, of nutrients, you know, in, in the light we use, in the, the nutrient dosing we do. And, uh, and that was very interesting, you know, for, for them as well. And, you know, right now we're on campus. So we have access to a massive amount of, uh, you know, I would say brain labs and everything to, to increase, you know, our development and, and our R&D. So for you, you've had investment, you've had proximity to an R&D base and you've got the market uh, to, to your relocation. Yeah, it's, it's exactly that. I mean, for us, it was a, a very interesting package, you know, for yeah. that, you know, and, uh, and you know, Saudi, uh, you know, at the same time is, is very changing, you know, right now, uh, they really try to open, they really try, you know, to bring people to open to tourism, to open to, to start up to everything like this. So I think it's really the right time to be in a country like that, that is uh, changing. I think, you know, uh, food, I mean, actually, this event is even, you know, Neom, uh, what is a big city in Saudi that has been built, you know, is, is one of the sponsors there. So they really, you know, focus on that. And because a lot of things they are starting, um, you know, the, the food tech is an important part of it. Sure. Can I, can I maybe move that question over to you, David, around uh, the, the importance of location of the business? Is it, uh, does it give you a competitive edge? What was, what was the thinking? Presumably because of the size of the, of the area that you needed, that was a bit of a limiting step. But can you just talk us through the thinking about your sense of place um, for App Harvest? Absolutely. I think, I think location is a strategic decision probably for everyone 
who's looking for a better way to make food. Um, and whether it's the hyper local grown in your own home um, or in your local supermarket to our approach, uh, which, which works in concert, but is different. You know, we chose central Appalachia in the United States. We chose, for example, Kentucky um, as our first location because it's getting wetter. And when we talk about enhancing nature uh, with technology, you know, our, our rainwater reservoir <laughs> is a very good example where um, we, we can recycle all of that rainwater in a location that potentially due to climate change may be wetter and wetter throughout time. Mm -hmm. Location is important for us because um, really our competition isn't other great companies um, who are using technology for mission like we see here on this call. It's, it's really the incumbent, you know, something like two thirds of all vine crops for the US are imported from outside the United States. They're shipped over days and days, in some cases weeks. They're often covered in chemical pesticides and they've been bred to be optimized for transportation. So picking our location, uh, which we hope to be a bit like bringing the Netherlands to uh, central Appalachia, allows us to be a day away from 70% of the buying population in the United States. So location was important for you know, our mission, but frankly, from a business standpoint, it's important for cost of goods sold. It's important for being able to serve customers product that's optimized for nutrition and taste versus transportability. Um, I think it's, it's very important. That said, the innovation that you know, you're seeing the panelists discuss globally, if you think about the kingdom, you know, Kaust has done an amazing job with technology as noted in the harshest conditions. And Mark has noted he's interested in, in that region as well. If you look at Tomasic's 30 by 30 initiative in mm -hmm. Singapore, in, in Southeast Asia, th there are so many um, epicenters of innovation and the global need is one where we need a diversity of approaches. The approach that we're taking needs um, to, to be working in concert, frankly, with all the other different approaches. It, it is not a zero sum game. And that's because the aim to be pragmatic is not to compete with these great mission aligned technology companies. It's, it's to replace open field farms that are not doing well by the planet or for consumers health, full stop. Um, and so if you orient that as the competition, it opens up the possibility of helping each other, which, which I'm very excited about. Um, absolutely. So, so Mark, uh, just just moving to you. I think you you've been working with the Abu Dhabi Investment Office, is that right? You've got big plans in in the Middle East, presumably for similar reasons to Gregory. Could we ask you to ever can someone to unmute Mark, please? Sorry, there. Thanks. Yeah, it's uh, exciting to hear um, as we're hearing these different stories about what's happening in, in different regions. Um, the Middle East has definitely been one that's a, a core focus for us. Uh, in fact, uh, Dubai Holdings has been one of our key equity investors uh, through multiple series in, in multiple years. Uh, and that predates uh, the, our latest work with the Abu Dhabi Investment Office as well. Uh, we have operations and offices in Abu Dhabi. We have um, in the build out of what's gonna be the world's largest indoor vertical farm just for R&D purposes, 90,000 square foot facility. And that really speaks to uh, when we talk about the work we're doing with other Fortune 500 companies, but trying to help unlock even bigger opportunities in this industry. And kind of to David's point, uh, there's a much bigger pie that we can create here in terms of where we can have an impact. And so uh, this kind of a facility is actually being geared to be the latest in not only the machine vision, machine learning, but AI, but robotics, drones, the idea that how do we think differently about what's gonna be needed for that next future generation and how we can help them be able to solve not only uh, from a crop standpoint, but also from a technology standpoint. And so uh, working with the right partners can help accelerate this. And I think that's a key lesson in, in any of the work that we're trying to do as we build a company is getting that right alignment. And so we've been fortunate on the technology side, uh, Dell uh, has been one of our key technology you know, partners as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's also alignment when you think about uh, importance of those investors. Um, so in our effort to go public, we're working with the Spring Valley Acquisition Corps. Uh, their focus is very much on sustainable businesses. And so uh, for us, uh, this has been part of our DNA from day one. Uh, we were one of the early adopters of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation Circle Economy 100. Uh, our CEO, David Rosenberg, uh, had the first ever Cradle to Cradle certified product. 
Uh, he co-chairs for the World Economic Forum, the, Glo uh, the Global Circle Economy Task Force. So we're constantly thinking about you know, how to do more with less. Uh, we also are a certified B Corporation. So thinking not only about that environment, but the societal. And so we applaud you know, the efforts of other companies like App Harvest to embrace this as well, because business can be a force for good in terms of thinking about how do we do better. And so, yeah, this is an exciting time, but the right partners and right affiliations can help bring everyone you know, forward. Uh, just quickly, we did want to talk about one key initiative that we have uh, that is a global initiative that we're doing. Uh, it's through an organization here in the U.S. that's uh, the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research. Uh, we've worked with them on a couple of different projects. And the most recent one is called Precision Indoor Plants Consortium. This is a global collection of different companies that are helping try to solve you know, these broader agriculture you know, um, questions in terms of uh, not only from the, the growing and the environment, but also even down to the genetics, how do we create the right products to be able to optimize for the indoor environment and think about, again, how we can benefit the broader industry. And so it's exciting to be able to think about how we can work collectively for bigger solutions. And that's, open. is that invitation only to join the consortium? Are you still looking for people to, to join? What's the model? Yeah, I mean, there, there's a core group in terms of um, the initial founders, uh, but the idea is here um, in working with organizations like FAR, um, the idea is to bring in expertise and, and organizations. And so um, it, it's an opportunity for to bring other people into the equation. Brilliant. Okay, that's grand. Thank you. Max, can I just turn to you with the, uh, the place and location question? Have, have you been making some strategic decisions around location of the business to give you a competitive advantage? Well, I mean, we have Miele in, in the background now and they're active globally. So that gives us access to basically any market. So it's really um, highly dependent on our, on our strategy and what market we offer, what products at um, or in. Um, but currently we're, we're located here in Munich. And uh, the main reason why we're here is really because we, we started the company here and because we have a great access to, to talent here. We have a very international and diverse team. Uh, we're uh, roughly 40 people now with um, over diff 15 different nationalities. Um, and yeah, we, we have great access to talent here. And in terms of location, for us, it's not that important because we don't distribute food. Um, we ship our consumables dry in, in paper packaging through mail. Uh, so we don't need a cool chain. We don't need to transport anything uh, from, from A to B uh, because we're not transporting food. We're just shipping seeds. Um, so that makes it very, very convenient for us um, because we can just make use of the existing, um, yeah, what do you call it, postal services. Yeah. And they are available anywhere. Fantastic. Yeah, you don't need your own logistics system. You've got the, uh, the, mail, the mail system. Excellent. Exactly. So um, I'm trying, so please, uh, those of you that are in the meeting, please do keep putting your questions in through the chat. I'm trying to weave in your questions with the discussions uh, that we're having with the panel on your behalf as well. And uh, there's a, a question has come in and one I wanted to, to talk about was around genetics and the, the fact that, and I think this is probably starting to change, but when vertical farming was in its infancy, the, the genetics was really for um, varieties that were adapted for a, a, a different environment. So, uh, Mark, you, you referred to the fact that you were looking at the, the genetics and trying to, to do some optimization. Is that, are you, are you going to be owning your own propriety varieties? How do you, how do you see that working? Yeah, well, that's a, uh, definitely what's exciting in terms of what's ahead of us. I mean, we've been able to take the approach with this fully controlled indoor growing to think about phenotyping. How do we control the environment to be able to optimize and get the plants to express different characteristics? And so we've been able to take that now and then marry that with the genetics to even think about how to get better product characteristics, not only around yield, but nutrition, taste, um, and then important things like shelf life to think about how do we improve uh, the whole value proposition? And so we see this as definitely the next uh, frontier. It's through a uh, collaboration. Uh, when I mentioned the work we're doing with PIP, the Precision Indoor Plants Consortium, that's uh, very much focused um, on the genetics. Uh, we actually are the principal investigator. We actually are fielding all the research for this consortium. Mm -hmm. uh, we're looking at over you know, 500 different types of, of lettuces and the next generation uh, of product there. 
Um, our expertise goes back to, um, we actually helped co-develop the first CRISPR-9 uh, type of produce product. Um, and so we're using that expertise we have inside to be able to help address you know, these broader uh, questions. Uh, and what's exciting about the PIP consortium is it's very much uh, lettuce is the initial, but other categories um, will be applied very shortly as well. So huge opportunities. And it's really, again, we think about for us, it's been about having that level of control and precision uh, and understanding both the environment uh, as well as the genetics uh, and then the systems to be able to put together the right learnings around that. Sure. And David, can I, can I ask you the questions about genetics and, and varieties? Uh, have you seen a, a trajectory to uh, more bespoke and appropriate varieties for these sorts of conditions? Absolutely. You know, if you think about um, the use of technology broadly in food, it has been largely concentrated over many decades in the hands of very few. Indeed. And one can only look at the industry you're speaking to, which is broadly the seed industry, whether it's natural phenotyping or the use of data analytics to speed that process up, or as you mentioned, true genetic modification. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at that field, the a number of companies who remain independent of the very large few, you can count on two hands. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the opportunity is not to focus science or genetics or phenotyping for the purposes of big ag open field farms, transportability, reduction in costs at the expense of health or the planet. Mm -hmm. But it's to use that same technology, that same science um, for good, if you will. Um, I, uh, broadly, I am a big believer that innovation and technology can be used for great harm or great benefit. And genetics is no different. Um, as you know, from my former days at Impossible Foods, some global problems have such urgency that we have to look at all our tools, including GMO, uh, which I believe is a wonderful way in many cases to do great good and in some cases to do great harm. It's all about how one uses it. Um, at App Harvest, our focus today is much more on the natural phenotyping. We've had success um, with understanding how from seed to plate, um, our system at scale, this Moorhead farm, um, can work in partnership with the best possible seed. Uh, but we're not eliminating any possible use of technology. You know, we do have 12 of these uh, farms to build in the next short few years, and, and we're going to look at all of it uh, to try to make sure we deliver the mission. Excellent. And, and Max, I'm going to come to you, and there's also a question come into the chat about is it presumably part of your consumables is a, a pre impregnated seed mat or something, is it, that goes into the plant queue? Exactly. Yeah, we call it a seed bar. So it's basically a dry substrate with integrated seeds and nutrients. And um, in terms of, of genetics, we're not um, currently working on, on changing on any of the genetics at the moment. It's really just about understanding it, uh, but more from a phenotyping aspect. Um, so given the, the benefit that we have lots of individual closed environment units, so you can imagine it like hundreds or thousands of little micro vertical farms, um, we are capable of, of collecting tons of data about different plants that grow under different environments. And that's one of the main benefits really of, of vertical farming is that you can change the environmental aspects around the plant, the light, the climate, the water, the nutrients mm -hmm. uh, to then um, get a certain repetitive controlled expression mm -hmm. within the plant and that can translate into the plant changing its morphology so its shape uh, but also the taste profile even the color as well as the, my, uh, the the secondary plant metabolites so that's something that then translates into vitamins or antioxidants or polyphenols um, and so we're really looking at it at the moment, at least still mainly from an environmental control aspect and not so much from the genetic point of view, because uh, at least in, the, in, in Europe, um, that some genetic modification is something that's heavily criticized in the public or frowned upon. And um, it's something that we therefore stay away from at the moment. Presumably you need some very stable genetics. Uh, you want something that is a tried and tested uh, germplasm if you're going to be putting it into something that needs to perform on a very reproducible basis in exactly. people's homes. Yeah. That's yeah. why we work with uh, the leading seed companies in the world. Um, 
they're extremely good at what they do uh, and we don't need to um, go into every individual part of the vertical. Max, while you have the talking stick, there's a very specific question that's come in around the um, dimensions of it. Do you have plans for a customizable size of plant cube in the near future? Uh, customizable not, but there will be different versions uh, in the future, yes. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Little aside there from one of the questions that, that's come in. And then finally, Gregory, um, what's, what's the appetite, ambition to, to move with the genetics to be able to influence the, the, the type and the quality of product that's coming out uh, from uh, within um, Natufia? Oh, have you hung on us, Gregory? I think Gregory might have frozen. If you can hear us, Gregory, we'll move on until we see you move. Yeah, I think we have lost him. Are you there, Gregory? If you could unmute yourself, please. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I got disconnected for, for a minute. So I didn't hear if you asked me any question or if you asked me to, you know, if you were still on the... Um, on, on the genetic part, you know, yeah, but so on, 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 you still, yeah. And that, I, you know, I really, you know, joining, you know, David on the idea for that. I think, you know, the last, I don't know, maybe, maybe 50 years, uh, you know, everything has been done, you know, in terms of genetic, of, of breeding the seeds uh, really have been for the, you know, shelf life, uh, you know, to, with the pesticide and everything like that. So when we do, Indoor farming, we enter a different world where we don't have to uh, to focus on this type of aspect, you know, mm -hmm. because we protect it for insect and, and everything like that. So we can focus on something what is very different, uh, what is exactly the taste, uh, because of the proximity. We can really increase in terms of you know diversity of choice. If I just take basil, you go to your shop today, you have what two type of basil, uh, you have hundred sorts of basils. Um, but you know, for logistic point of view, is not possible to bring that in a shop uh, but with vertical farming we know can do it you know and, and we can be sure that, that we bring this biodiversity you know and um and lately i mean you know everybody speaks about organic because no people are understanding that and they're moving to organic uh, organic is meat, you know is no pesticide but i think the next step people will start to understand as well um, that is not only about pesticides, it's about the nutrient value that you have in your, in your plant, you know, in terms of vitamins, in terms of minerals. And this is something in vertical farming that you manage with, uh, you know, with light, with nutrient, with, you know, any kind of factor that we can, that we can manage. So I think that we can do really, I mean, beautiful things. I think it's a new world that's really open. And, um, and exactly, we can make, you know, the genetic, or, you know, if people are against, you know, like GMO, you know, it, it can be simply through breedings. That, that is a very natural way uh, to bring, you know, different, you know, species or put the species together or even rediscovering, you know, old species that have been completely lost on the on people's table. Yeah, sure, sure. Thank you. OK, so I hope that's uh, there, there were quite a number of questions about the genetics piece. So I hope that um, that helps address those. Can I turn now to the issue of inputs and particularly energy? And uh, this is always a conversation that I'm sure you all have routinely about the energy equation and the energy balance. And uh, maybe to kick that off, there's a, a question's come in uh, around the energy needs of aeroponics. So maybe Mark, you might want to pick that up. Uh, is, it, is it the case that the energy demand of aeroponics is higher than that of hydroponics or hybrid systems? Um, so you have different approaches. So it, you know, the answer is it, it would say it would depend. Um, and there's a couple of different types of approaches with the uh, hydroponics. Um, there's probably an underappreciation that you need to do a lot of aeration you know, of the water for a hydroponic system. So there's a lot involved in terms of, you know, how do you create that and how do you do that? Um, but clearly when, you know, people look at the farm, they can see the lights and that's kind of the takeaway. Um, but this is really about how do we give the plant exactly what it needs uh, in terms of both uh, the light, but also the nutrients. And so uh, this allows us to be more efficient, whether it's uh, using the aeroponics or whether it's using the LED lights. And even our lighting um, luminaire uh, is uh, actually one of our own design uh, approaches. Our, our chief technology officer is actually formerly of GE Lighting, formerly of a publicly traded LED company. 
uh, one of our key investors has been one of the biggest investors in LED lights. So we think anything about the right strategic partners. So we have um, a lighting approach that we think is easily about 24 months ahead of others in terms of efficiency and, and cost and performance. So that's definitely part of the equation. Uh, but it's also understanding, again, how do we optimize for the right crop churns and the right productivity from the yeah. plants that um, we think is the right business model. And I think what's more important is like when you frame this in the broader uh, context of looking at versus field farming, again, under appreciation of what's happening in terms of all the inputs there, but um, you think about central California, right? Their rate of um, water consumption is faster than the replenishment in the aquifer. So they're having to, you know, do new pumps, bigger pumps uh, that are running and having more energy consumption. But all that um, that's embedded in terms of the processing, uh, the washing, the, the transportation, the refrigeration, the, the food miles, I mean, that's all contributing obviously to a very big footprint. Uh, but the biggest one is if you think about food waste and you know, many people know that about 40% of food is wasted uh, on the back end for leafy greens, you go all the way back to the farm, it could be even over 70%. And that's a lot of, when you think about the embedded energy and, and uh, that's gone into that. So by enabling this local production, you know, we can bypass, you know, a lot of that um, aspect. Uh, we can actually have a, a longer shelf life with the product as well. And so the consumer is going to get a chance to enjoy it. And so we're changing you know, that fundamentally. So there's lots of different ways of being able to look at how to frame, you know, the discussion around the energy. I'm so pleased you brought up the waste. There's been a number of questions in the chat about how you're all dealing with waste uh, in, in the businesses. So did you wanna just, while you've got the talking stick, Mark, just just uh, have a, a, because obviously you can be as efficient as you like, but once it leaves yeah. your facility, then uh, that's where quite a lot of the food waste happens. So what, what are your views on that? Yeah, yeah, well, fundamentally it's, you know, when you think about traditional farming, it's, um, you know, you grow it, you take it to market, you hope to sell it. and uh, for us, everything that you see that's planted behind us has been planted for a specific customer. This is just in time growing. Uh, so incredibly much more efficient just from that proposition. Uh, the idea that it's harvested and in the store within 24 hours, um, again, is changing that value proposition. Uh, but again, when we think about uh, germination, we think about our productivity, um, it, it's fundamentally changing, again, that product output. And then we're actually able to do something as well. We're able, actually able to do a second harvest uh, and use that product uh, out in the marketplace as well. So there's different ways of, you know, kind of thinking almost uh, uh, a stem to, to, to leaf kind of mentality about how do you monetize the entire plant as well and, and think differently about, again, uh, how do you think about the right business model? So there's a lot of work that we're doing that we think this helps foster a, a better approach to the overall food waste challenge. Sure, great, thank you. David, can I come to you about both energy and waste? Because I'm guessing you're kind of part harnessing sort of a bit of the sun's energy, a bit of the kind of free stuff as well as uh, giving it a bit of a boost. So uh, what, what are your thoughts on the energy equation and, and the waste issue? Well, you know, our approach because of the scale um, of our model, you know, our model is, um, you know, 2.8 million square feet uh, of controlled environment agriculture, for example, at just one of our future 12 farms, is, is to leverage uh, sunlight, is to, is to leverage passive sunlight. It's not just because it's, it's efficient, um, frankly, it's pretty critical for grapefruit, um, mm -hmm. as those in the industry know. We do supplement uh, in order to help the efficiency of our model with, we like to think, cutting edge LED technology as well. And because the grid, you know, what people don't talk about um, oftentimes when we think about these types of businesses is we are part of a broader business ecosystem. And, um, you know, when I was doing renewable energy for PG&E, for example, the large utility here in the Bay Area decades ago, uh, it's the grid uh, that is oftentimes for at scale businesses, which is an important pragmatic consideration. We like to think we're pragmatic. So participating and exploring things like virtual power purchase agreements to allow the offset of what power we do consume off the, the existing grid in central Appalachia is an area that we're focused on. But because we own you know, this 60 acre uh, farm in Moorhead and the land, we have the ability over time to install our own sources of active solar. And we haven't committed to that as a public company but I can tell you we're actively looking at that as part of our network of these future 12 farms. 
Um, with regard to waste, um, you know, I, I had the chance to work for nearly eight years at a company called Del Monte Foods, where I ran the, the food business. And um, this is an important pragmatic lesson too. We can learn, those of us upstarts can learn from Big Ag. Uh, and, and one of the things we believe is that the vine crops that we're starting with are naturally well suited for added value products. You know, if you think about the 40 tons of tomatoes that we can produce out of just one farm, um, we're beginning to explore added value products that have longer shelf life to address waste. And then as everyone has commented, you know, versus open field import of vine crops from outside the US, uh, being able to be more proximate, you know, within a day of 70% of the buying population means that our perishables are being consumed with less waste. So much of that waste, by the way, occurs at the home, to be clear, and we have not yet figured out a way to get into everyone's house. But um, the, the waste that occurs in the supply chain over weeks and days from, from countries here in the US, anyway, um, imported from countries outside the US uh, is, an, is an area that we think we can be active and helpful on. That, that's very interesting. And, and Max, you are in everybody's home. Well, that's, that's the plan, isn't it? N not in everyone's yet, but that's the plan, yeah. Um, well, our... You know, the thing is, the, the company is run 100% on renewables. Our production is 100% based on renewables. We pay close attention to uh, where our materials come from. That's also why we produce the units in Europe and not uh, outside of Europe. Um, and uh, we offset the, the remaining CO2 that we haven't yet been able to reduce. Um, so our products are 100% climate neutral. Um, and we obviously also encourage our customers to then run their units with renewable energy. And food waste is in our case, not that big of a topic because the, the produce grows at home and you really just harvest on demand what you need and what you don't need, you just keep it growing and then you harvest it a couple of days or a couple of weeks later. And do you have a sense that people do manage the system in that way or do they go, oh God, I haven't had salad for four days and the whole thing is has gone mad and, and now I've got a new seed bar has arrived and, and I've got to throw that one out and start again. Do you get a sense of that? No, not at all. Like the, 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 the I would say the, the, the consumers are very conscious of how they use it and also what they put in their body. Um, so it's, I mean, it's a very per peculiar, uh, a very particular target group that we're addressing here. You know, not everyone wants to grow food at home uh, and some people are, are skeptical initially uh, but we've put a lot of effort and time and money into making it as easy as possible. So it's really foolproof uh, and anyone succeeds even with a, a dark gray or black thumb. <laughs> yeah, that, that leads us very nicely. So, so Gregory, uh, everybody wants to be a gardener, but they don't want to get dirty, I think was, was your line. So if they have got uh, black thumbs, as Max uh, described it, presumably that proximity to consumer uh, has a, a very strong waste angle to it, does it? Yeah, that, that, that's definitely. I mean, the, the point is that, um, you know, first, you know, in our machine, you can grow about 32 plants at the same time. Okay, so you can bring a pretty, you know, wide diversity so people can organize themselves and because they have this constant visual in front of them, it's, you know, it's pretty easy for them to organize their own garden. And, you know, a plant, a salad is, you know, is not ready at, you know, exactly, you know, 28 days. If you eat it after, you know, 31, 32, 33, or, you know, 26 days, it doesn't matter as well. So in terms of waste, uh, I would say you have a, a zero waste on, on this point. And I think you have a zero waste as well, uh, because maybe when you buy a salad from a shop and you just put it in the fridge, uh, this salad maybe doesn't have, um, I don't want to say a sentimental value, but uh, it's just something that you bought and you put in your yeah. fridge. When you grow your own salad and you watch it grow, uh, that's bring like an educative point, uh, a respective, you know, things between you and, and nature. And I think that that's very important. So then, you know, I think that the people take conscious that, you know, to grow this salad, this took me time, even if, you know, the machine automated everything, uh, you bring a respect between nature and you. And, um, you know, and that this adversity to, to waste, uh, it, it's become very different. 
Okay, it's not something that you bought, you bought for a few dollars and, and you trust it doesn't matter. Yeah. So I think the ways we solve it by, by these two problems, proximity, but as well this interaction with nature that, that we created in, uh, in, in our system. Sure, sure. And presumably in the Middle East, uh, light isn't a problem. Light is uh, it's a problem because it's uh, it's getting hot with the light. So yeah, our machine, you light. know, I yeah. yeah, our machine are integrated in the home, um, and you know that's you know we, we do that with uh, with LED light, and you know and for this reason, you know, is is no you know is no problem on this uh, on this level. But again, about the food and about the waste is is bring as well, um, you know, beside the fact that there's big diversity of of plant that people can eat there. Um, you know, we have some plants, even they said they change the, the food habit uh, because, you know, they have this natufia in front of them in the kitchen. You know, I'm from France, you know, when you're hungry and you get home, you know, you go and you take a piece of cheese and, and bread, you know, in US you're going to take your peanut butter. But then just watching this, they say, then I feel a little bit guilty. And, you know, then so that I make myself, you know, a, a salad, you know, but Saudi, like um, other countries, they deal with a big problem of obesity. Uh, you know, even in children, like, like, you know, we have in the US as well. So I think, you know, that's a problem, you know, that, you know, with, with vertical farming in general, uh, it's, it's very important that people have, you know, easy access to, to food, uh, because now we're speaking about the specific, but, you know, the health issue for people is, is, is very important. People like to have this, you know, easy access. You just go to McDonald's and it's easy, you just access it, you know, but you know, if you can do the same with, with fresh, clean, you know, food, that's, I think we, we solve a huge problem, like a medical problem. Yeah. For sure. So I'd like to change gear a little bit and, and talk about, I'm, I'm going to lump, uh, there's been so many questions coming in, I'm going to lump them under the sort of bucket of uh, product, platform and profit. So I think one of the, so um, I'd like to explore your kind of business models in your individual companies and you know we've heard about SPAC we've heard about IPO we've heard about acquisitions so I'd like if I may to, to come to you in turn and to just hear about your different business models and how that's impacting on your growth plans but also the piece about uh, the business model for selling not just the food product but also potentially the platform as well. So, um, David, can I can I start with you on that? Um, we had a little bit about the SPAC at the, at the top of this meeting. Uh, do you want to just talk about how that impacts on your plans for scale and then the, uh, the platform versus product and then the profitability piece? Sure. Well, we live in an unprecedented time where large scale public investors, whether they are ESG investors or they are growth equity investors, technology investors, infrastructure investors, they're all converging on the fact that there is a great appetite from an investor standpoint for companies who stand for better operations. And it's in part driven, I believe, largely by consumers who are increasingly asking for uh, an understanding of their choices and how it impacts the world and their health with regard to food. In, in one of the things we saw, interestingly, during this terrible pandemic, um, that has obviously been full of tragedy. One of the, can I call it a silver lining, is that it's made all of us much more thoughtful about the choices we make. You know, whether it's in the case of my days at Impossible Foods, how animal agriculture contributes to destructive powers on the planet, but but also for the very pandemic. Um, our relationship with animals has an impact or in the world we're in uh, today that we're discussing, what does it mean um, to pick a tomato uh, on, out of a, uh, an aisle in a grocery store that comes from oftentimes Mexico or, or somewhere else? Um, and what does it mean for the labor and how well or, or not they are treated, uh, the laborers to produce the food we eat? So our, our approach is to try to lay bare and hold ourselves accountable to not just pre creating a great product, but to try to produce it in a way that both consumers and large uh, public company investors can reward. Um, and it's hard. I think the, the burden for us at App Harvest is higher uh, to be able to operate this way, but it's an act of faith that the world of investors and consumers might possibly reward it. Mm -hmm. So how does that carry through to your question about branding and profit? 
to be clear, we have to make our investors a tidy return. There is no way around uh, the world of business. We're not a nonprofit. Um, we stand uh, on the, the, the notion that we have to be financially self-reliant. So we do ruthlessly look at cost of goods sold and long-term gross profit margin. You know, we bought our Moorhead facility because it was a great return on invested capital for our investors to do so. But part of that is that the business needs to fund, those profits need to fund the value proposition of the product. There's no lack of demand, by the way, for a locally grown, in our case, tomato that has no chemical pesticides and uses 95% less water. It turns out the consumer has been ready uh, well before perhaps we in the business community was planning for it. And so as a result, um, while we like to think that the company's brand and eventually the brand you see at point of purchase makes a difference, right now, just producing the large amounts of product that we intend has no lack of demand, however it shows up. As long as people understand the difference between buying a conventional incumbent product versus the products that we're talking about as a panel. That's the good news. This uh, incredible openness and awareness by the, and I'm not talking about in the US, the bi-coastal wealthy consumer. I'm talking about everyday consumers. We saw this at Impossible Foods. Um, everyday consumers are worried about the choices they're making for food and are looking for better options. Um, and, and because of that, it, it creates what I call a pull effect that the industry hasn't had. We used to always push in big food, you know, better solutions, eventually hoping it meets the consumer. Consumer is pulling big food and new food companies like those here uh, to do better through technology, through transparency, uh, through business practice. Um, it's, it's, you know, it was very intentional that we created a new skilled labor economy in central Appalachia to replace coal mining jobs. I mean, that is part of our mission, but it's also part of the appeal to many public company investors. And I hope one day to consumers. Sure. Nice, nice story there. And, and Mark, can you, can you talk to us about platform versus product versus profit? And hopefully the three are not mutually exclusive. Yeah, definitely. It's not an either or uh, proposition. And, you know, we know fundamentally that you know, this makes for good business uh, in the approach that we're doing. Um, for us, in terms of, again, not only the commercial growing, but then how do you extend that expertise and be able to unlock more value for the organization is something that's been tremendously exciting for us to think about areas that we can have an impact. So uh, we very much have a focus on that commercial production, but this platform in terms of a understanding uh, the plants, the biology the system, that approach is, uh, I think, a powerful one in terms of thinking about, you know, we can actually work on a wide range of different crops. We've grown over you know, 550 different types of crops to think about where we can have that impact. And so this is, uh, again, where we think we can try to think about the right uh, areas and, and right uh, industries where we can um, have the right business proposition. So. We can work with a wide range of different um, partners, wide range of different geographies, uh, and think about bringing solutions. I, I do want to go back to the comment and thought and discussion around brand. Uh, that's my passion. That's my background. Uh, uh, coming from the world of large CPG, actually before this, uh, as well as on the retail side and having had in the marketing for supermarket chains, it's incredibly important that you understand how to connect with the consumer and the power of the brand, power of the Aero Farms brand, what we've been trying to do in terms of uh, lead and also inspire, but hopefully uh, provide that confidence to the consumer, uh, we think is a very differentiating uh, and defining aspect about who we are and what we're doing. And so the consumer uh, is very much looking for that transparency, that story, that authenticity, and understanding again who uh, that company is. And so uh, when we talk about uh, it's not just certifications or awards on the wall, it's our actions and, and what are we doing within the community. Uh, we are very active in terms of uh, an exciting initiative we have is actually with the World Economic Forum Healthy Cities and Communities Initiative, mm -hmm. where we are launching distributed farms. These community farms are gonna be showing up actually in municipal buildings. Uh, our first partner is in the city of, of, New, of Jersey City in New Jersey. And uh, 10 farms, some showing up in city hall, some in senior citizen living, some in schools, but we're bringing the farm right into the community and it's gonna be grown for the community and the product is gonna be given to the community for free. 
So there's tremendous opportunities to be able to have impact. And that's part of our ethos as a company. Again, thinking about all those stakeholders, the large scale commercial production is what's gonna fuel uh, the ability to have even broader impact in schools and communities like that as well. Nice, so there's actually a kind of corporate social responsibility piece that's that's feeding into that as, as to help build a brand as well as a very clear and robust business model. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. excellent. And Gregory, um, your, your thoughts on the, the profit platform product Please. So profit platform product for our case, you know, we give more like a tool to, you know, to our clients and they are their own gardener. And, um, and the beauty of that is, um, you know, then because you have nobody in the middle, uh, you just give them the tool, uh, you know, it's not because you're going to use a little bit less of nutrients or you're going to make the, you know, a little bit less days of growing and you're going to increase your profit. Uh, you know, there I think the customer want the best and, you know, he's in his way, and if you want to wait a little bit more days, or that's mm -hmm. so for us, yeah, we don't have really this uh, this factor there. Um, as a company, uh, just you know, recently, for example, we're working on a, on a project with an organization in Saudi that's help uh, you know women in uh, in it, in the kingdom. Uh, to grow some kind of uh, some business and they give you know this type of micro loan so we're working on you know something where we can you know put our natufia in the hand like that they can be you know the own goer in the in the little community you know so it's, it's not a big scale but everyone can grow little things and, and become like a, a gardener in you know in remote area where you know agriculture is definitely not not a possibility you know so as a company we try to do you know this type of things as well um you know educative project in uh, in schools uh, like you know i go back to my point that is very important this interaction with uh, with nature mm -hmm. so to to give some natufia to to different school like that the you know the kids the children can can interact with it can understand the process and uh, you know and again this, this mutual respect you know come uh, come to it you know? sure Great, thank you. And and Max, you've been through. So you you're in an interesting space as a kind of wholly owned by a bigger organisation. Clearly, you are selling a platform, not not food products. Just talk us talk us through how that journey with the Melia acquisition has has is kind of powering your scaling. Um, it's it's actually been incredible. You know, I was always very skeptical of of merging with with a big corporate. Um, I've never worked in the corporate world. I've, uh, I quit university to found my own startup. So, uh, and then I, I yeah, invested basically seven years of, of my life to, to build that company until we merged with Mila uh, in 2019. Um, you know, the thing is obviously we, we have to put a focus on profit, uh, on, pro on becoming profitable. But uh, the wonderful thing is given that Miele is a, is a family owned business, they think very long term and um, we align on their values of sustainability and, and technology as being the core of the company. Um, so it's enabled us to think and plan really long term and we're not uh, subject to opinions of our, um, let's say uh, VC shareholders as it has been in the past. and. Mm -hmm. um, given that uh, sustainability is, is basically the core of, of what we do. Um, it's built into the, into the product development uh, as well as everything we do at the company. And um, the cool thing is with vertical farming technology, you know, by understanding plants and how they react in certain environments, um, not only can you increase quality and yield and um, time to harvest, but over time, uh, it also becomes cheaper and more efficient to grow produce. Uh, and I think that's super interesting. And given the fact that we, we offer a platform, there's a lot of interaction with our consumers. Uh, we listen to, to what they want. Um, uh, we, we have a a big group of, of testers that constantly give us feedback about our products. Um, people can, can basically give us uh, uh, wishes about new varieties that they're interested in and in all sorts of things. And, and next to that, 
Um, we also work with schools because the, our product is a great educational tool. So uh, we work with a lot of schools and kindergartens to reach the younger generations, the, the future vertical farmers, so to say. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, golly, I'm conscious that the, the clock is, is ticking fast and there are so many questions. There's, there's two main topics I'd, I'd like to just cover off before we finish, but before we do that, there's one topic that keeps coming up again and again in the questions and that's around pollination. Now, obviously not for every product do you need pollination, but uh, would somebody like to just pick up the pollination services uh, in controlled environments and I think uh, Max and Gregory, you're probably excluded from uh, needing to answer this one, but Mark or David, any quick reflections around pollination services, please? Yeah, Mark, I'm happy to start. And then um, I'd be curious to, to hear what you think. Um, we actually are at the very early, early stages uh, to the poser of the question and understanding how to do this at scale. Part of it is we are still determining um, how to map the market opportunity with what we're seeking to grow, actually. Because the size of our facilities uh, measured in, in tens of acres um, is so large, we are um, thinking through the right use of different types of crop adjacent to each other in a controlled environment ag system for their mutual benefit. Nice. Um, and because we're so early on, this question of pollination is actually a topic of, of real discussion today, but we're still too early on, frankly, for me to give you a definitive answer. I, I, I would love to connect with um, whoever's interested in this area because we're, we're, we're just seeking to learn. And the great thing is we're going to have so many large scale farms soon that we have an opportunity to incorporate new technology uh, and new opportunity. And this is one of those areas that we're just, we're a little bit early on. Brilliant. And can people reach out and connect with you via LinkedIn? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Max and then Mark. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's, I, I read some of the questions that, that came in and I think it's an amazing business opportunity because I don't know how it's done in the US, but what we do over here uh, in, in Europe is that there are actually companies that, that rent out bees and bumblebees um, as a service. So if that's not being done in the US, I would say that's a great business opportunity. Um, and there are varieties of, of fruiting crops that you can also grow without pollinators. And uh, in our system, it's really cool because we can just um, increase the, the, the air velocity and thereby uh, get plants to, uh, to pollinate. Right, well, I, I know that um, one of the people who asked the questions, Yulia, that one's for you and uh, there's an opportunity there for you, um, Mark. Any comments on the pollination service sector? Yeah, this, you know, I think what's been captured is that there are a wide range of options. And Max, there's definitely those services here in the States that are being utilized <laughs> uh, very large scale um, from um, these services. Uh, but we also look at, uh, and this is where it's exciting from a technology uh, you know, how can we mechanize and, and use some um, technology to be able to think about different approaches. Uh, Max has suggested one thing through airflow. I mean, so there's different things that we've been looking at as well through system design uh, that can help facilitate that. Uh, and so we think that there's some opportunities further. And it's also about the, you know, the different crops that you're doing, obviously, and there's different considerations. Sure. Gregory, unless you have a particular comment you do on pollination, yeah. I mean, you know, for us, like, you know, like Max says, uh, you know, we have an internal ventilation system that helps that because we have, we have a small system, you know, I think on, on a big system, it's a, it's a different technical matter, you know, on this level, but exactly, we, we use the, we use the flow. Huh? Okay, excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. And uh, pollination service question, people, you know what to do, uh, reach out to, to these people. So in the, the last few minutes, I have two questions. And the first one, and if you could keep your answers uh, fairly crisp and brief, is around you. Know, you are all leaders of this industry. You have built businesses. You've got the battle scars. What do you think are the major challenges that still face the sector? And if we could go, uh, Gregory, Max, David, and Mark. So, Gregory, what would be your kind of wish list to solve uh, the, as one of the major challenges that you see facing the sector? Well, I think right now we're all, you know, working, you know, hard on it. I mean, all 
you know the the, the speakers that are you know here with me and uh, i think we just need you know more people in you know in different sector like you know big scale small scale super small scale um the investors um you know i think on the big scale because this it's agricultures uh, so they are you know maybe more you know willing to do that on the smaller scale is maybe a little bit you know more difficult i mean in our case we, we got lucky we have cost like a, uh, you know big institution in our back but i think it's not you know easy when when you speak about hardware and you know this type of things so yeah if you know investors could be more involved with you know smaller scales uh, that that could be you know can help a, a lot of you know smaller companies that are, that are trying out there okay so investors engaging with smaller companies max what would be your uh, big challenge that you see still needs unblocking I think it's really um, rolling this out internationally at scale and it needs a collective effort from all of us because we're facing uh, yeah, dramatic consequences if we don't, not just in terms of climate change, but in terms of soil degradation and biodiversity loss. So it's really about creating awareness for the benefits of indoor farming for a certain niche category of products at the moment, uh, as well as the benefits of other uh, solutions like regenerative ag um, but if we focus on vertical farming, I would say it's energy efficiency and creating transparency. So I really love what, uh, what David and Mark are doing by going public because it'll uh, be a proof point for other investors and also newcomers to the space to uh, really understand the financial metrics behind it. Um, so yeah, I would say it's, it's awareness and, and generating more acceptance in the public. Yeah, building, building that investor confidence with some potential to make some money yeah David what what do you see as a pinch point still to be un, un, unblocked well we've all become quite fashionable those of us in however we call it food tech and my greatest concern is that we have um, what I call divisions uh, or green on green warfare you know we have to all remember that the size of the addressable market is enormous that there is no need for scarcity thinking or zero-sum game thinking I I would hope, Mark, for example, that our teams are not distracted by trying to differentiate from one company to another. We all need to work successfully, but we can all do so together. And we're so young and yet so well capitalized that, I, that my wish is that people envision a future in 20 years where there's a whole ecosystem of companies. Like It's not like there's one ring to rule them all in conventional ag today nor there should be uh, in a future better world, uh, a one dominant player versus another. We all need to be successful together. Nice, nice sentiment. And Mark, finally to you. Also, if uh, Gregory had wanted to be able to weigh in as well, but um, yeah, happy to share. Um, one of the things that uh, we're taking very much that lens in terms of a broader perspective, uh, I just want to highlight is around the area of food safety. And so one of our biggest concerns is uh, you can see even on this call, a lot of different companies, a lot of new uh, emerging companies that may underappreciate what's actually needed from a food safety standpoint. And so uh, we certainly don't want a setback that can um, set everybody back. And so one of the things that we uh, have done, we're one of the founding members of something called the CEA Food Safety Coalition that is intentionally uh, coming together. There's over 30 different companies already participating how we can help self-govern, develop new standards, help educate FDA, CDC um, on our differences in growing versus the field and be able then ultimately to reassure the consumer. Uh, we're actually are, are in the final stages. We're gonna be rolling out a specific new certification standard, working with different certifying agencies. Uh, and then there's going to be a CEA food safety seal of approval uh, for companies that are following these guidelines. And so, we think we can actually work better than government in terms of being able to move industry and be a catalyst and move faster in terms of, again, uh, we've got great um, retail advisory partners, um, the biggest ones, you know, from Walmart uh, on down that are helping us be able to set the right agenda here. And so, again, this lens about how do we move our entire industry forward is something that aero firms we're, we're very much focused on as well. Brilliant. Thank you. Now, I'm, our final question is going to be, please, one, one line answer. And you are all entrepreneurs uh, who've got great success and track record. What piece of advice would you give to your younger self if uh, you met them now? And we'll go in the same order. We'll go Gregory, Max, David, Mark. So one piece of advice, 
one line and hopefully something that will inspire those who are watching. Gregory, one piece of advice, please. Okay, I will say, you know, just take the time to experience and, you know, see and, you know, discover what you want to do with this, uh, with this life and, you know, focus on it and don't give up, you know, and do it and do things because life is, life is going fast and, you know, there's no time to be, to be wasted and there's so many things, you know, beautiful things to be done. Brilliant. Great sentiment. Max, one piece of advice, please. Um, to my younger self, I would say there is no rush. You know, you should try to find your purpose um, and try to align that with a clear vision. Uh, and once you have that, work hard on it because you are the master of your own universe and you can create your own reality and anything is possible. Lovely. Inspiring. Thank you. David? I would tell my younger self, forget about finance and operations. First, learn marketing and sales. Yeah. Figure out how to create a consumer movement and that and everything else is the means to that end. Perfect. Nice message. Hope everyone's taking notes here. And Mark, the final word rests with you. Yeah, it would have been um, to find that passion, you know, even earlier. And, you know, it requires a tremendous amount of commitment you know, to bring these ideas to life, to bring these companies to life. Um, you know, you've kind of heard about this idea of grit and resiliency and, and passion, but it's having that commitment and passion is really going to be the key uh, ingredient there. And so, um, you know, it's a journey in terms of getting here, but if you can find that passion early on, follow it. Fantastic. Thank you all so much. On behalf of our audience, can I thank our speakers? And uh, it's been a great discussion. I, I hope you've all enjoyed it. Sorry for we haven't asked all the questions, but please do reach out to the speakers. I know they'll be really happy to talk to you. Alessio, back to you. And thank you, Belinda, for the great moderation. Thank you. Indeed, indeed. Thanks, uh, Max, for, for pointing this out. I was going to start exactly from there. Thank you so much, Belinda, for taking the time. Thank you, David, Mark, Max and Gregory. I know you're very busy and we really appreciate you uh, taking the time to actually speak with us today. Um, I could have kept really the, the conversation going for hours. It was so interesting and the, the amount of questions that we received was overwhelming. And again, sorry if you cannot take them all, but for the sake of time, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that we've picked, you know, the, the, at least the most relevant ones and uh, uh, there will be time to actually address them, you know, later. Um, without further ado, as we also have overrun a little bit, let me just uh, close up uh, this session. Um, I just wanted to, uh, first off, again, thanks the, the panelists and uh, the amazing moderator we had and remind you of the next webinar uh, and actually that we have on uh, the 21st of April at uh, uh, 6 p.m. Uh, Central European time. We will be talking about food waste with um, Jebby Krami, co-founder and director of Too Good To Go, Holder Romer, founder and CEO of Wasteless, Christine Mosley, founder and CEO of Full Harvest, David Jackson, director of marketing and public affairs of Windows, and Jess Jenny Du, VP of operation of Appeal. Um, we're super excited about uh, finishing up the series of webinars on this very topic, and we look forward to uh, welcoming you to our next uh, uh, session uh, uh, on the 21st of April. Uh, thanks a lot, everyone, for taking, to, uh, taking the time to, to, to tune in as well, and we wish you a very lovely morning, afternoon, or, or, uh, or uh, evening uh, whole. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you all.